hello everyone. Um, thanks for joining um, uh, us today. Um, so in this session, we're going to talk about um, uh, running serverless event-driven microservice architecture at scale. Um, so we um, heavily use um, Lambda microservices across Polego, and you know we've come across like every single problem you can think of, and we'd love to share some of those insights today. A few tips and tricks, hopefully that you can use in your stack too. Um, so. Here's what we'll go through. Um, we'll give a little rundown of Polego's infrastructure. Uh, we'll touch on what serverless is if it's if it's new to you, uh, the challenges we faced, infrastructure and our continuous integration and continuous deployment pipelines, and some extras um, tips uh, that we, um, I, I threw in there that help that would have helped us a couple years ago. So um, a sneak peek at our infrastructure. So um, we serve users all over the world, and we use AWS. So um, we're in about a hundred and we serve about users in about 180 different countries. Um, so with that comes various challenges. So um, starting off from the left, um, so we use a AWS to build Polego. And you know, um, especially during COVID, um, these are the numbers we're talking about. So in, in a given month, we're running about um, 110 million uh, messages in SQS requests. Um, we're running about uh, 150 million calls to our API endpoints. Um, we're storing about 300 terabytes of files across multiple regions um, across nearly, uh, across um, over a billion objects. And our databases go through about 6 billion requests um, every month. With that comes with lots of interesting challenges. Um, so in terms of our stack, we use about 50 different AWS services. So um, products for containerization, serverless functions, which, which we're touching on a lot today, uh, data streaming analytics, data storage, secrets management, and CI/CD. Um, we use an event-driven architecture, which use, um, and you, that uh, means you use events such as, you know, adding something to a basket, or in our case, opening a book, for example, um, and to communicate between uh, decoupled services. Um, so there are some benefits um, of that that I'll just quickly touch upon here. Um, so um, first up, it allows uh, services to scale and fail independently. So what you're doing is if a given part of your platform uh, requires seven different endpoints, splitting them up into seven different microservices, if one fails, then that component of your platform or website can fail independently and gracefully fail so your users don't get a um, kind of bad experience on, on your site. Um, next thing, it increases um, development um, agility. So um, we uh, depend heavily on Lambda-based microservices. And um, uh, what an event-driven architecture allows is teams to independently work um, on various parts of the platform and then be able to predict and kind of scale um, load for that, for a given Lambda function, um, based on you know if there's any marketing drives or anything like that, so that really helps us given a role for our company, and it also um, helps us cut costs. So given you know event-driven architectures are push-based, so everything happens on demand um, as an event presents itself. So that means we you know just as Toyota has lean manufacturing, we're already we're ready with compute capacity as required, not over provisioning, uh, which is which can get expensive, which we'll run into as well. Um, so. As mentioned, uh, we use extensive um, extensive use of Lambda functions to scale infrastructure, and we integrate this tightly with um, uh, API Gateway also from AWS. Um, so, um, first of all, um, I, you know, working at Polego, um, we run a lot of serverless, and we realize that sometimes this isn't as common as we think in the industry because we're, we're kind of in our own bubble here. So I wanted to quickly touch on what it is, just so I can highlight um, uh, the advantages of it. So let's say um, I consider an example. Uh, I have a service, microservice, um, uh, to display book metadata. Book metadata are things like, you know, whether or not... Um, 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 whether or not it's available as an EPUB or PDF, how many pages it has, the author, description, whatever, all the stuff you imagine on a book website. Um, so let's consider building this two ways. If you just use a server-based approach, Amazon EC2 instance, you're paying for compute capacity whether or not the service is being used or not. So displaying book metadata, you only need it when you're showing a user a book. So does it make sense to pay for compute capacity when it's not being used, it doesn't really make sense. Whereas with the Lambda function, which is serverless, you're paying for compute uh, capacity only when your microservice is being invoked. Um, so in our case, we just simply upload code and dependencies to AWS, and it scales up and down seamlessly. And most importantly, it does it very quickly within milliseconds, which is something you can't get from an auto-scaling group, really, um, in an Amazon EC2 instance. 
So here's some maths, which I'll quickly run through to kind of put some numbers behind this. So suppose I have a microservice. I run this on a instance, EC2 instance. It has eight gigabytes of memory. So the way we calculate kind of compute capacity is we take the memory, which is in which in AWS is proportional to the CPU, and we times it by the number of seconds in a month, which gives you a gigabyte second calculation of capacity. So in a month, we have about two and a half million seconds, times it by eight gigabytes of memory, and your total capacity is about 20.7 um, million gigabyte seconds per month. Now on the right-hand side, if I break this down into a Lambda function, suppose I run this metadata service, for example, 2.4 million times a month. It takes 190 milliseconds to invoke, and let's say only uses 114 megabytes of memory. If I time this all together, I'm only using 51,000 gigabit seconds per month. So as you can see, we're getting all the same functionality, but at a fraction of what we would have used in EC2. And even with the per higher unit cost of Lambda, we still get massive gains in terms of cost and efficiency, which is really nice. Um, so challenges and tips. Um, so it's not been complete smooth sailing, and I'd love to go through some of the challenges we faced, or, or especially over the last couple of years, as we scaled Pelego. So the first thing is, unlike a server, um, a Lambda function, um, when it's invoked, that's when you have your compute capacity. And you can have cold starts and boots. So for example, a serverless function may cool down when it's not in use. So for example, during your peak times, it might be super fast. But sometimes, you know, maybe at off-peak times in the nighttime, uh, you might not have very fast executions. So what do we do? Well, the opposite of cooling down is you know, to warm up. So we keep our Lambda functions warm. Um, so what do we do? We use ping functions to periodically invoke Lambdas. So what we do, we use CloudFormation as our infrastructure as code tool, and we specify a ping, a scheduled event every five minutes, and you can literally imagine a stick poking a Lambda just to make sure it's awake and ready to act when we need it to. And this has drastically um, increased the stability um, of our microservices using Lambda. Um, next up, we have monitoring, logging, and tracing. So in a event-driven microservice architecture, systems are distributed. But what it means is every part of it produces logs. And it can be really hard to make sense of what's going on at any one point. So what do we do? So we build dashboards for every microservice. And every single team which manages a microservice um, has their eyes on that dashboard all the time. We use X-Ray, which is a distributed tracing tool. And we use CloudWatch um, logs. Now, we use log insights from CloudWatch because you can literally query logs with, with SQL-like language. So if you're looking for a specific um, uh, uh, comment or, or, or log output or something that indicates an error, you can search for you can search for it in your code, which is nice. We also use AWS X-Ray. Um, so this, um, aside from producing a really cool graphic, um, it allows you to see exactly how Lambda is interacting with other Lambdas, other services in AWS, and it gives you a great visual of what's going on. We really like using X-Ray at Lego. Next up, DDoS. Um, so with big scale comes big responsibility to make sure um, your services are safe from abuse from the internet. So what do we do? Well, we protect our APIs, which, um, so what, what we do is we set Lambda concurrency limits. Concurrency is a measure of how many Lambdas run at once in an AWS account. Uh, so for example, if your account can run up to a thousand at a time, we want to protect it. So for example, we won't let more than 500 run at a time. So in the case of DDoS attack, we're protected. We have timeouts. So if you know, there's some injection happening and it times out a Lambda. Um, you know, if the timeout wasn't there, just run infinitely and rack builds up. Timeouts allow us to avoid that. And lastly is API gateway throttling. So as I mentioned, we use API gateway and Lambda. API gateway invokes our Lambda functions. So throttling um, allows us to make, allows us, you know, given an IP address or given certain user agent, we can um, block requests if they exceed a certain limit in a second or a minute or something like that. Um, next up, uh, knowing your quotas and limits, and boy, this, this has called us out before. Um, so don't forget, um, every AWS account um, has account limits. Uh, so for example, I believe when you start an AWS account, the concurrency is 1,000, or you, know, you can run up 1,000 Lambda functions at any one time. Um, what we um, have significantly increased that, go to AWS, complain enough, and they will increase it for you in the service, in the support section. And lastly, um, be, be aware of the Lambda limits. So Lambda now supports up to 10 gigabytes of memory with six vCPUs. If your application needs more than that, don't use Lambda. Uh, don't, don't you know, spare yourself the headache of doing so. Okay, it's a secret. Um, so 
as you can imagine, storing sensitive information like database, you know, credentials and so on, um, don't store that as, in, as environment variables because, you know, it's not encrypted as such. So what um, we use is a combination of um, is AWS Secrets Manager and Parameter Store to store sensitive information. And that then uses AWS's key management service or KMS to uh, encrypt our, um, encrypt our uh, secrets. And then we use the Lambda functions IAM execution role to call the secrets manager. So this is a super safe way of storing, retrieving uh, your secrets and secrets manager scales um, as freely as your Lambda functions do. Okay, um, separate logic and handlers. So in a Lambda function, um, handlers act as an entry point to your functions. W you know, the worst thing you can do is dump all of the logic um, in, in your handler because it will just make it really slow to run and it doesn't promote code reuse. By separating logic into other modules, you can reuse co code across multiple Lambda functions um, as necessary, which is a better practice than ma having massive handlers um, uh, in your code base. Um, next up, DLQs. Um, so dead letter queues help when debugging failing Lambda, execu uh, Lambda executions. So for asynchronous invocations, um, dead letter queues um, can be sent to SQS um, or SNS, um, which, um, which is a notification service. And what it helps to, our teams do, our software squads responsible for a certain microservice, is it helps debug thought executions. And we use alarms, which then trigger, you know, tells them to you know, go ahead and start exploring why a certain microservice of theirs is failing. Um, next up, um, 1792 megabytes. Um, so when you create a Lambda function, you assign a um, amount of memory allocated to the Lambda function, a maximum amount. And we're very specific with our Lambda memory values. So it's important to, important to remember, um, the Lambda memory allocated is proportional to the CPU. The more memory you give it, the more CPU you get out of it as well. So one 790 megabytes, it corresponds to exactly one vCPU of power. And basically, unless your Lambda is running you know, um, across multiple vCPUs or is multi-threaded or is multi, um, goes multi-core, this amount is the optimal value um, of um, execution time versus memory. When running Lambda, your build um, is just a combination of memory times time. So what happens is if you give the Lambda more memory, the execution time actually goes down, and that means the increased Lambda memory gets canceled out. But the result is you get faster execution time. So this is a really nice way um, of getting the most of Lambdas, and it's a nice, uh, clever way of making the most of AWS. Um, serverless scales, which is great, but sometimes it scales a little too well. Um, so, you know, sometimes um, we need to help our serverless functions out with queues or streams. So what we do is we prevent overloading our Lambda systems. You know, for example, if, if a Lambda function is responsible for writing or querying database or some Redis Elastic Cache or something, we want to put a buffer in place, an elastic buffer, to make sure the Lambda doesn't just you know, destroy um, uh, you know, databases and cache clusters. So we use SQS queues to kind of you know, limit the speed at which um, requests go in, to, to, queue, um, to queue them in messages. And we also use um, Kinesis, which is a, you know, it's a family of products in AWS, but we use Kinesis data streams as well uh, to buffer our requests going into Lambda functions. And this really allows you to control how executions are carried out in your infrastructure. Okay, well, um, I think we're nearly there um, for this section. So um, load and performance testing, um, there's no better peace of mind than actually testing the systems to make sure they scale. So we use JMeter, Palego, um, it, you know, performance tests help us determine if a system behaves properly and it you know, um, examines stability, speed, resource usage amongst, amongst other things. Um, and load tests, um, you, know, you know, given a high number of concurrent users, does our system scale? It helps answer it helps us answer those questions. As I mentioned, we like JMeter. It's integrated into our pipelines um, when we create a new microservice, which I'll touch on at the end. Um, but yeah, we like JMeter, but there are other tools out there. Um, caching. Um, so caching is really vital. Um, it really helped us out. So API Gateway um, has caching built in, and we, we take it in even further and use edge locations. So we use edge optimized endpoints, and it utilizes edge locations, which are little um, nodes like smaller data centers AWS have, which are geographically closer to users. And again, this helps us improve load times across parts of the platform to all of our users around the world. Okay, infrastructure and CI CD. Um, so, um, how do we manage our infrastructure and how, we how do we deploy it safely? So, test 
test and then test again. Uh, so we run um, a whole suite of tests in our code pipelines. We run unit integration API tests, um, which also run developer machines. So even before it's committed, we, we know it's committing good code. Um, we then programmatically run load tests and security tests, and we also run audits to make sure the packages that the Lambda uses aren't uh, vulnerable in any way. Test-driven development, or TDD, is really important here. Uh, we also use blue-green deployments, um, so that allows us to check a production environment before it runs uh, to real users in the world. Um, again, we don't have to second-guess if a production environment stops working during a new deployment. Um, next up, cloud formation. So this is... This is our bread and butter. We use a ton of it here. Um, and we run several hundred Lambda functions in um, uh, production across dozens of different microservices. And what happens is CloudFormation creates stacks, and the stacks are created in pipelines after um, tests are run. Um, and then we've gone even further, and internally we built a framework uh, for backend services. And this simplifies the design, development, and deployment, and monitoring of Lambda functions. So. Why is that important for us? We're a growing company. We need to develop features really quickly. The fact we can go from ideation to having a production-ready you know, microservice in about a couple of weeks really helps us stay agile and, and, and um, develop, user, develop, develop features that our users um, love. Um, and lastly, backups. Um, so all of our code artifacts from um, CloudFormation um, are stored in an SV bucket. And we can actually roll back within 60 seconds. Uh, so if, for whatever reason, we deploy and something's gone wrong in production, um, from alarm sounding to the fix being in place, we can do it in under a minute usually. So um, this setup has served us well. It has the legs to grow. And we really like it um, using code pipeline and CloudFormation change sets. Um, lastly, um, I'll just quickly touch on a few things uh, to wrap up. I'm going over time, I think. So um, know when to go serverless. Don't go serverless for the sake of it. So properly understand if your system will benefit from it. So if your service is likely to be hit nonstop in a day, um, or if you have something mission critical where you can't have, you know, you can't have cold starts, maybe don't go serverless. Uh, stick with an EC2. Um, maybe containerize it using Kubernetes and put an Amazon EKS or something like that. Um, next up, um, and to finish up, uh, I just want to touch on fan out patterns. So what it allows, and this is the thing that really unleashes the power of serverless, is it allows you to distribute work to multiple instances of Lambda functions. So you can fan out with Lambda functions, SNS, or SQS. And we'll take a look at a couple just to give an idea. Um, so in this case here, um, this is a simple example. Uh, a Lambda function executes other Lambda functions. Um, you can do it synchronously, um, but it's more common to kind of work with it asynchronously. Um, so initiated Lambda doesn't wait for the response uh, from, from the Lambda. And it, you know, if, if one of the child Lambdas has an issue, it turns into a DLQ. So in this way, you can break apart a certain piece of logic into um, uh, you know, multiple Lambda functions and you know, scale really well and then get really high performance out of it. Um, and lastly, we've got one with um, SQS. So what happens is you send a message over to SQS, then the lambdas are kind of automatically started. And this is a really nice system for batch processing. So for example, um, in our case, when publishers sends us, you know, thousands of books at a time, we need to make sure we can, you know, our serverless infrastructure can cope uh, with processing all of those thousands of books at the same time without destroying all of our other systems. So we put them in an SQS queue, and then lambdas just feed off of it as and when they are free uh, to do so. Um, so yeah, that, that's just a couple of fan out patterns that we use, we really like, um, and hopefully they can benefit you too. Um, and that's about it from me. Um, I, I hope uh, I try to fit in quite a lot, so I hope I didn't go too, go too fast or anything. But if there's any questions, I'll be happy to kind of answer them.